In this video, we're going to talk about phylogeny and systematics, uh, specifically looking at classifying organisms, why we classify organisms, and how we classify organisms. Um, organisms can be classified into three main domain groups here, uh, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. Um, and obviously, there are quite a few different branches under each of these, eukaryotes being uh, quite a few different um, organisms and ones that we would most commonly think of. Uh, but these are th kind of the three main categories that we define life by. And these have changed um, over time as we gather new information, and, and especially with the ability to uh, sequence DNA for different s species and look at uh, the DNA analysis of different species, we've been able to classify organisms even more specifically uh, with new technology. Um, phylogeny is really the evolutionary history of a species or a group of species. When we're talking about systematics, we're talking about the classification of organisms and determining evolutionary relationships um, between those different organisms. And so again, those can become more specific uh, with new technology, specifically the ability to, to sequence DNA and to analyze the DNA differences between different species. And so why, the first question is why do we classify species? Well, there's some definite advantages to classifying species. Um, one, identification of organisms. Uh, two, to examine evolutionary links. Uh, three, prediction of similar characteristics shared by members of a group. For example, um, here's uh, a tree here that we can look at. Um, we have a number of different species here. Um, Canis lupus being uh, a wolf, um, modern wolf species. And because these two species are grouped uh, closely to one another, um, we would expect that they would have some very similar characteristics. Overall, all of these organisms here, we would expect them to have some very similar characteristics in, ex uh, in comparison to maybe a different organism, such as maybe a frog or a bird. All of these organisms, because they're more closely grouped, um, we would expect them to have more similar characteristics in comparison to some very different species. When we're looking at uh, phylogenetic trees and, and when we're classifying organisms, um, we can look at nodes, and we've previously talked about nodes uh, in our uh, development of a, cl a cladogram. Um, but for example, number one right here, these two species being very closely related, uh, one right here being a common answer for both of those. Um, for number two, these two species uh, right here sharing a common ancestor. And at number three here, this one represents an interesting aspect here, um, these three species being closely re re uh, related to one another. Um, and, and this node of three right here representing, representing the common ancestor for all three of those different species. Some additional reasons of why we classify organisms. Um, characteristics that are shared by organisms within a group would be expected to be found in other closely related species, and more closely related species are grouped more closely together on a phylogenetic tree. Some things that we just saw as well. Um, some definitions for clade and cladistics. A clade is a group of species that includes an ancestral species and all of its all of its descendants. That last uh, portion is important. The all of its descendants is, is important. And let's look at an example to see more specifically what we're talking about. So in our example here, we've got uh, a, a tree here, and we've got three different colors uh, showing different groups. Um, the red and the blue are clades because they show the complete branches, and they include um, an ancestral species and all of its descendants. Here being the ancestral species and all of its descendants branch off of that, same thing for the red. In contrast, the green is not a clade because although it does include um, an ancestral species and a number of descendants, it does not include all of its descendants. In order for the green to be classified as a clade, it would need to include everything that's highlighted here in green as well as everything that's highlighted here in blue because these individual species here would be part of the descendants of this ancestral species. For cladistics, uh, an approach, uh, it is an approach to systematics by placing organisms into groups, clades, um, and that's being based primarily on common descent. We've previously talked about homologous and analogous structures. Um, many organisms share similarities in their structures, and those can be caused or derived from a number of different causes. Um, and first, looking at homologous structures. Um, homologous structures are similar structures or position of structures, or even the development of them, uh, and, and that is caused by a similar ancestor. Um, but it may not necessarily be similar in function. Uh, there could be some different functions of those, of those particular structures. So some great examples, uh, whales have uh, pentadactyl bones in their flippers. It's kind of the arm bones 
uh, that, that com comprise the bones and the flippers. Humans have those same pentadactyl bones, um, five bones that make up their arm structure. Uh, we obviously use those for some very different purposes. Kevin Durant dunking here, uh, whales swimming in the ocean, very different purposes, um, different functions, but they have the same similar structure. The opposite of that is analogous structures. And these are similar in function, but they are not due to a common ancestor. Um, they're not derived from a common ancestor. And they also can differ in their fundamental structure. And a good example of that is the wings of birds and the wings of bats or insects in this example. Um, both of these different species here have wings, but they are not derived from a common ancestor, and they have different fundamental structures. Next, we want to take a look at the biochemical evidence and universality of DNA, um, and there's going to be a couple different points for this. Um, the first being that all known organisms use DNA as genetic material. An important thing to remember is that the DNA code is universal. Um, so whether whatever organism that you're looking at or comparing, the DNA code is going to be the same, and it's comprised of those four nucleotides, uh, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Um, and so, actually, we can take portions of a DNA code from one organism or to another organism or, or within the same species, and it can be placed or inserted into, into a different organism. So, for example, an experiment, uh, an experiment has been done where the gene or the section of DNA that is responsible for producing um, legs in a fly, that's, that gene section was inserted uh, into a different portion of the DNA uh, for, for a fly uh, in order to produce legs on or in the location of where the eyes would be. So here's a normal uh, fly head, here's the mutated, if you want to call it that, um, the purposely mutated fly that's had that gene for producing legs inserted so that the fly now has some legs on its head. Uh, this is completely possible and it's made possible because DNA is universal. And so because all organisms have those four nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, um, this is possible. Secondly, proteins are made up by the same 20 amino acids. And so we've previously talked about how proteins can be made um, and how those amino acids are connected by peptide bonds in order to make a protein. The only difference between proteins is the arrangement um, and the amount of amino acids that are put together to make that protein. Um, and so this suggests that all organisms have um, some similarities because all of these proteins are uh, composed of the same types of amino acids, maybe in just different number or different arrangement. Thirdly, amino acids can be left or right orientated, but we actually see that all uh, are of one orientation and that happens to be the left. Um, all living organisms use the left-handed orientation um, and, and the hypothesis suggests that more left-handed amino acids are actually found in, um, are, uh, dis were discovered in meteorites. And so this suggests that maybe uh, those original amino acids were all uh, were produced or, or came from uh, present on Earth now because of the landing of a meteorite uh, on the planet. It's just one possible hypothesis. Our fourth one is the cytochrome C protein. And this is a protein that's about 100 to 104 uh, amino acids um, put together to make this protein. And it's used in the electron transport chain. And it's found in plants, animals, and unicellular organisms, um, but is really, really complex. And because of its complexity, um, it's thought that uh, the ability for it to evolve independently in all of these different groups of organisms, so, so to be present in plants, animals, and unicellular organisms, for it to be present in all of those, and because of its complexity, it must have been passed from a common ancestor. And so if a common ancestor um, is present for plants, animals, and unicellular organisms, and it passes that down uh, throughout many generations into these different uh, species, then that would suggest that they are derived from a common ancestor. One of the last topics, uh, one of the last two topics we're going to look at is variations in phylogeny. And variations in the DNA sequence for proteins exist between species. Uh, the more closely species are related to one another, the less differences that they're going to have in their DNA sequence. Um, and, and this is common for any organisms um, that you look at. Um, the difference between humans and Neanderthals is 0 
0.04% difference. It's a very, very small difference in the DNA sequence, uh, but that causes some differences in the species between humans and Neanderthals. Species with less variation would obviously be, be expected to be more closely related. Um, a good example of this is humans, chimpanzees, and the rhesus monkey. Uh, going back to the cytochrome C example that we saw in the previous slide and discussed, not, uh, the cytochrome C uh, protein is not the same in all species. Rhesus monkeys um, have one amino acid that is different from humans and chips at the 66 amino acid. And so what this suggests is that humans and chimps are more closely related because they don't have a difference in that one particular amino acid, whereas rhesus monkeys have a different uh, amino acid. And so because theirs is different than both humans and chimps, they're less closely related to uh, the two of those. These variations can be caused by mutations. That's usually um, one of the primary causes of these variations. If we were to look at some different uh, DNA sequences, we can actually determine um, which, how they would compare in terms of relatedness or how closely related they are. And so I've got four different DNA sequences here, and I would suggest pausing the, min uh, the video here in a second. Take a look at these and see if you can identify differences and where those differences are located in reference to the first sequence here. So we're looking to see what differences two, three, and four um, have in terms of the DNA sequence, each one of these sequences, sequences representing a different species. Go ahead and pause the video and you can give you a chance to go through this. So hopefully you had a chance to look at this and have noticed that uh, there are a number of differences here. I've highlighted these differences in red. Um, some things that we can analyze and deduce from, from these differences is that number three has only one base pair difference um, from species one, number one, and therefore we would expect it to be most closely related to species number one. Species number four has three, uh, has two more base pairs different in comparison to number one, and it is less related to species number one in comparison to species number three. So if we're looking at it, comparing everything to species one, number three would be most closely related to it, and then number four. And lastly, species number two has four different base pairs, which are different than those of both three and four, suggesting that it is probably least related to species number one and also less related to species number three and four. Quite a few different differences there. Um, our last topic, primary topic that we're going to look at, is variations and evolutionary clock. Um, by looking at DNA sequences and, and using that information that we can gather from them, we can kind of help to, to develop an evolutionary clock. And we're going to look at this at a very simple, um, kind of basic level. Uh, these can get extremely complex. Basically what we can do is calculate the time since two different species have diverged. And we can do this by, com um, by comparing the DNA uh, and protein sequences between different species in, uh, in order to be able to do this. If changes occur at a regular rate, we can actually estimate the time of divergence. And so looking at an example, if we've got um, species A, B, and C here, if species A has five differences from species B, whether those be specific differences in the DNA sequence or in protein sequences, or even before we had that technology by looking at structural features that we, that we can examine. Um, if there's five differences between A and B, and there's 10 differences between species A and C, we can deduce that these two um, species of A and B um, have, are more related, and the differences between A and C, this split between A and C happened twice as long ago as the split between A and B um, because we're looking at those differences. And so to, to finish up this one, um, uh, cladograms and classification can indicate relationship among organisms. Cladograms, as we've seen, are divided into clades, and clades are groups of organisms on a cladogram who share some common characteristics. For example, birds have feathers, mammals raise their young and produce milk, and lastly, reptiles are vertebrates with eggs, which are cold-blooded with scales. All of these organisms share those things in common. Um, and so that's it for this last section on phylogeny and systematics. Um, I've produced a, and made a separate video on how to construct cladograms, uh, which you can find on my website. And to end up this video today, we're going to do our first of uh, Where is Mr. Rote. I've taken a picture of a location in the Portland region, regional area. Um, if you can identify this, go ahead and, and uh, take a guess. I've got prizes for the first person to get it correct. You can submit this on my website. There's a link on the Development of Life page. Go ahead and take a guess, and uh, the first person to get it correct will have some sort of prize, and we'll continue to do these throughout the rest of the videos for the year. Good luck.